Humans have a love-hate relationship with change. We need it for growth and variety, and yet we hate the upheaval it brings into our lives. Resilience seems to be the answer. So let's explore a new kind of conversation where we look at the turbulence of change and the resilience that enables us to not only survive it, but to truly thrive from it. I'm Paula Shaw, life transition expert, grief counseling specialist, and author. I'll be spotlighting influential people on this podcast, people who have taken the steps to change it up. So join us as we share valuable information to help you navigate the rocky waters of change. Come on, jump on in. Welcome to Change It Up Radio. I'm your host, Paula Shaw. (coughs) Excuse me, (coughs) a little foggy this morning, a little croaky, I should say. Anyway, I'm so delighted to be here with you because we have an amazing show that we're going to be doing today. We have information that I think is really important that we want to bring to you. So listen up, everybody, because we're going to be talking today about foster kids, foster youth. We want to, as you know, we're looking this season at the theme, A Season of Grief. And I mentioned in the very first show that grief is the normal natural response to any kind of significant loss. And boy, if we're going to talk about people who have had a significant loss, foster youth have had a huge loss. They've lost their parents. They've lost their home. They may have lost their familiar surroundings. So there are very, very big losses these kids are dealing with. And and I know probably like me, many of you have heard these nightmare stories about kids being abused in foster homes of that, which if that happens, it's even more loss. But I, I really want to find out from our guest today, what are the realities that foster youth live with today? Is is there ongoing grief? What kind of help is there for these kids? These are the things we're going to learn from our guest today. And she is Jenna Mendez. She is a foster youth counselor who works with kids from preschool through 12th grade. So it's a big gamut of kids that she works with. She's also the liaison to the All-Stars program. She's a licensed professional counselor, nationally board certified counselor, and school counselor. And if that isn't enough, she's also an adjunct professor at Chapman University. So clearly, she is well-credentialed. She knows her stuff. And I'm very anxious today to learn a lot from Jenna, because this is an area I have to admit, I don't know as much about as I really want to, because like so many of you, when I see a group of people in pain, I want to do whatever I can. So let's bring Jenna on here so we can learn a lot more from her and do whatever we can to help the children. Come on, Jenna. There she is. <laughs> thank Hello. you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here because as I was saying in the intro, this is a huge thing. This is a big issue and I would imagine a big problem. And and Jenna, I think if if our listeners and our viewers are like I am, they probably don't understand or don't just know how does a child become a foster youth? What sort of circumstances have to be in place? So it's it's a very complicated process, actually. Um, it, states are different. So I'm out of California, so I know California law better. Um, but there's a lot of different ways. So children can actually be born into foster care if they are born to a mother that is tested positive for drugs, um, they're immediately removed. 
Um, and then also any abuse, neglect, um, you know, different things that are, are going on that are causing harm to a child. But I, I think there's a myth that, you know, one situation happens and then a child gets taken away. They really try, um, Child Protective Services really tries to keep the family intact because they know in most situations that is the best for children. But it definitely is not the best in all situations. And so there are situations that the families are not able to um, kind of grow and heal and, and work through some of these issues or diseases and, and, you know, addictions. And so they must be removed from the home. So they try their hardest not to do that. Um, but sometimes it is inevitable and it's what's best for the child. So obviously these little grievers, I'm going to call them, have experienced a lot of trauma in most cases, right? Even if you're, I didn't realize newborns could go into foster care, but even if you're a newborn and your mother's been doing drugs, you've experienced trauma because you haven't been allowed to form carefully, right? Or, or form it in whatever we would want the highest level of nutrition and all of that to be with a parent. So what, what happens to these kids? Like, obviously, you're on the um, you're on the team that's going to work with them, right? To bring them counseling, help them deal with the the stress and the trauma. Mm -hmm. but like a baby, you wouldn't work with a baby. You're working with preschoolers and up, correct? Right. And I'm coming from more of an educational standpoint. So in my private practice, I'm not um, working with foster youth, but um, as my role as a liaison and um, the district foster counselor, mm -hmm. I'm working directly with social services, with my county office of education um, and, and the county in general. And in my specific um, location in Southern California, we receive children from five different counties. Um, so it's not just students within my own county. They're coming from other counties, which is a trauma itself because yes. they're being removed from their school, from their home life, um, from their friends, everything that they've known. And now they're moving to another county just because there's space and a foster home available for them. Oh um, so the foster care really is just a cycle of trauma because you're removed from your family. And a lot of times, as we know, in abuse, um, even though that situation is awful, a lot, a lot of times children gravitate towards that, you know, adult or person that is causing the abuse. They want that love. They want that care. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it is just constant, um, trauma moving to a new home, moving to a new school, moving to a family that may not have the same, um, cultural aspects as you may not even speak the same language sometimes if there's not um, space available, and they may be separated from their siblings. Um, sometimes they are granted um, visits with their parent that has caused them harm. And sometimes that is a good thing and they want to be with their family. And other times they do not want to go back, but the court has said this is what's going to happen. So there is just repeated um, trauma, you know, for these poor children. And um, I, the age group I've worked with the most is high school. So I'm really seeing all of those effects um, by the time they get to high school. So it is, it is very sad um, situations. So when children are taken away, let's say that there's a circumstance, whether it's drug abuse or something else going on, mm -hmm. are there certain criteria that once they're met, the kids can go back home to their parents. What do the parents have to do to now qualify to have their kids returned? Right. So, so I'm on the education side, so I don't get to see, you know, sometimes specifically those confidential court documents, but the basics are um, there are certain uh, classes that a judge may order. Um, there's certain time um, that they need to either maybe get a job or depending on what the situation was, why they were removed. Um, they do give them adequate time to work on that, but it's also a flawed system like, like a lot of the systems. And so there's, you know, really hard situations where, you know, families may be doing the right things to get it back. And there's different reasons why they can't. So a lot of times it's, um, different classes, um, showing stability, 
and um, for them being able to move back into that home. There is, um, in California at least, we have a, a time called family maintenance. So that's after the student's been placed in a foster home for a certain amount of time, the family is working to get their um, children or child back. Um, it's a minimum of six months that they go into what's called family maintenance, and it's almost like a trial back with the parents. So they go back to the home. Um, the, the parent or guardian is still working on the things they need to um, work on, and then they go, you know, have another court date, and they'll close the case if everything is is adequate and safe um, for the child. Um, so there are different things that they have to go through. So that can be sometimes traumatizing as well if they are in a school that they are enjoying and don't want to leave. And now they have to go back with a family that has caused trauma, even if things are better. Mm. Now, are these kids automatically enrolled in counseling or therapy with the school counselor? Um, you would hope so. Um, so it, everything is court ordered um, or has to be in a court order. So I have seen where it's court ordered and then for whatever reason, it's not happening. Um, I've seen where it's not court ordered and I feel like, why is it not? Um, so there's a lot of, of questions. And, and I wanna say about foster youth, um, I know we're gonna make a lot of generalizations here and kind of talk you know, about the broad group, but every situation is different. Yeah. And so it just, there's so many different factors and counties and states that are doing things differently. So it really um, just depends. But, hmm. um, but yeah, they, and at least in our district, what we're doing with the All-Stars program is trying to get them um, connected and, um, you know, right there with their school counselor. So they mm -hmm. have that support. But I know not every um, district or state has that. So it's actually possible that a foster child can go through all this upheaval that we're discussing. And like we say in the opening of the show, we hate the discomfort of the unfamiliar. Humans just hate that. That's one of the reasons why change is difficult for us. But it is actually possible that some of these children, after going through all that, will not get time with somebody like you to help them sort through it and, and heal, correct? Right. Yeah, and part of my passion right. um, in what I do is I go and present at lots of conferences um, kind of around the United States and especially within my own state of trying to show districts what they can do mm -hmm. um, to support. And um, so that's just part of my passion is wanting to teach others so that these students don't feel alone because I was realizing um, as a school counselor, I would ask um, my incoming foster youth, which are transient all the time. So, mm -hmm. you know, we may have them for a day, a week, a month. If you get them for years, you're very lucky um, because they're constantly, their situations are changing, their homes are changing. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to show other districts what you can do um, and make them feel connected even for a day, a week, a month, a year, what, however long you have them. Oh, that is so wonderful because connection, as we, we humans all know, is critical, yeah. right, to yeah. all of us. Even if when life's going well, it's great right. to feel connected. <laughs> all right, Jenna, I have so many more questions, but we need to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the living arrangements for foster youth. So we will be right back. Is living in today's fast-paced world making you feel stressed and out of balance? Are anxiety, sleeplessness, depression, lack of focus, or weight gain robbing you of your relationship and your energy? If you're ready for change, you need to call Paula Shaw. Paula helps you identify and eliminate self-sabotaging thinking and behavior. Using a wide variety of mind-body techniques, she provides her clients with the most effective processes for their specific needs. To book a session with Paula, call 858-480-9234. That's 858-480-9234. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio. Paula Shaw here with my guest today, Jenna Mendez, who is a counselor on so many levels that <laughs> she's credentialed, she's board certified, she is a school counselor, she's the liaison to the All-Stars program, and she's an adjunct professor at Chapman University. And we're talking today about foster youth. And so 
we've if you missed us it, the first segment if you're just joining us we're discussing the trauma that foster youth go through being torn away from their parents torn away from their home their familiar surroundings and what is in place to try to help these kids to deal with that upheaval that humans are have such a problem with so jenna i'm curious what kind of living arrangements exist for a foster youth so you in order to be a what we call resource parent so that's a foster parent um, okay. guardian, um you must go through training um, background checks they come out to your home they make sure that everything is safe um, and so once you have a, a home that is safe, which is very valuable for these social workers, because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of places for children to go. We have a lot more children in foster care than we have homes and um, understandably. And so um, once they have determined that a house is is ready, it you know is there for um, the social workers to see. And then the children are. They try to pair them culturally. They try to do their, their best. And there are, are very strict guidelines on how many bedrooms you can have, who is living in the home, um, how many, you know, the ratio of males and females and, and age. They take all of that into consideration, mm. uh, which sometimes is why it's extremely hard to find a home. Yeah. Um, but then they are um, brought there and placed. And so also with um, education, they try to keep the children in their what they call their school of origin. So that is the school that they have been to, that they have a connection to, right. um, that they may have gone to before. But as you can imagine, with the minimal amount of foster homes, they that does not always happen. Um, so part of my job as a liaison is um, you know, constantly battling with um, either, you know, outside agencies or other districts and to make sure that our foster youth, um, their rights are upheld and that they can go to that school. Sometimes that means out of pocket that our district has to pay extra for transportation and busing, mm -hmm. um, even, you know, extremely far distances. So there's lots of meetings that go on to make sure what is in the best interest for the child. Um, <laughs> I want to put them on a bus for an hour to school in an hour home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not be in the in the best interest. So we have those meetings, and um, I love the partnerships that we've been building. We've all heard these nightmare stories about children being abused in foster homes. Yeah. Is that kind of a thing of the past? Does it happen? You know, how how strongly are these people qualified, or what kind of criteria do they have to go through? how strict is it you know where do we get these people is basically what i want to know well the hard thing is that you can never be sure what is going to happen to a child you know somebody can look great on paper they can pass their background check they can do everything that they need to do um but but for some people it is a business because they do receive a financial amount um, because they're living in their home. I mean, it's supposed to compensate for a child living in your home, which, you know, the food and the clothing and, and different things. Um, but not everything is always followed. And that's where um, part of what my job as well is advocating not only for the children, but teaching mm -hmm. the children what their rights are so that they can advocate for themselves because um, they'll come back and let me know, hey, I'm in a home and they start telling me these things and they're red flags to me. So I'm calling social workers and saying, did you know this is going on? Or I'm calling my county office of education for support mm -hmm. and saying, hey, what do we do in this situation? Um, so are there amazing homes out there? I have met wonderful resource parents um, that I have great connections with in my district. Mm -hmm. Are there horrible ones? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and those I try to, you know, keep my feelers out and be aware of certain homes. And I'm not afraid to call, um, in, in the state of California, we have child care licensing. And to be filed and reported. What What is a group home, Jenna? And do we have those in California? Yeah. Um, in my district, we have one very large one, and I am in constant contact with the social worker that um, is there, you know, working with the students in the group home. And we've done amazing work um, this year just trying to make sure that those students are appropriately placed at the correct schools. Mm -hmm. And 
just that in itself, that collaboration is so important because usually students go into a group home um, for more severe situations. So um, maybe it's behavioral, more mental you know, health issues. And so there is um, a higher level you know, of protection for these these students and, and also concerns. So, I, you know, before I didn't know who the group's home, group homes were in the area and there just was no collaboration between the school and um, this facility who gets students all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and our students are rotating in and out. And so it's been mm -hmm. such a great collaboration. And I think that's one piece of advice, you know, for anybody that's trying to work with um, foster youth in the areas to get to know, you know, these um, groups and start working in collaboration because too often we're working kind of in silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it just occurs to me that this, I don't know, all, all this upheaval. Now we've got kids living in a group home. So mm -hmm. in that situation, you're with other kids you don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've been taken from your siblings, as you mentioned before. You're, you're trying to keep them in a school that's nearby but or in a good school. But it could be that everything in your life, everything that was stable and familiar is now gone. Right. And and you're sort of and well, you are you're living with strangers. Mm -hmm. Right. And what what kind of staff do they have in group homes and where do these kids get love and attention? That's a great question. Um, so group homes are different than just the, you know, foster family homes and mm -hmm. Um, group homes are that higher level. So there's higher rules. There's there's more guidelines. There's more structure. Um, and you are living in usually their, you know, houses um, that they've used and, and renovated and created rooms. So it is like, you know, a college experience of living with a whole yeah. bunch of people and having no privacy. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have a lot of your own personal items anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and now you're being told what to do, where to go, how mm -hmm. to do it. And so it's extremely difficult um, for these students. And then we say, okay, now you have to go to school and you have to behave and, um, you know, fit this little, you know, mold. Right. So um, it is, it's constant, just trauma and grief and loss. And um, the group home that I do work with, I know that that, um, the, one of the social workers is fantastic, the staff, and she loves on them and she cares, you know, for mm -hmm. them. I've heard the horror stories too. So mm -hmm. that's where I feel like as a school um, and a school district, we don't know what the students are coming from. We don't know their stories. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they've experienced, but we know they've experienced trauma and are probably still, you know, experiencing it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I try to educate my own district, the teachers, the administrators, you know, not to look at the behaviors as just trouble or, you know, um, mm -hmm. that they're trying to do this. This is things that they can't help. And they just have the wall that we need to get the walls down. And we need yeah. to show them what a healthy relationship looks like and what, you know, good connection looks like. And that's the whole point of foster programs in schools, because sometimes schools are the safe place for those students. And we need to make sure that they are. One of the things that occurs to me is, <clears throat> how difficult it must be going to school with other kids who may have fabulous homes, moms right. and dads who dote on them, you know, great clothes, lots of toys and, and, and great things. How, do you find that these kids have a hard time feeling like they can fit in with that kind of population? Yeah, I feel like they feel like they have a hard time fitting in regardless. Yeah. And so, because they are different and, mm -hmm. and that's part of what, how our program came mm -hmm. out as well is that we realized that they didn't know each other and they thought they were the only one. Yeah. And I was at a school site um, as a counselor that had the most in the district. So we started pulling them all together to say, Hey, you're not the only one. There's other people mm -hmm. um, just like you. And so that started, you know, a big trend. But in that area, it was also very affluent. So the interesting thing about that is that you, when you have large homes, you can fit a lot of children. 
um, because they need to have their own space. You can only put two to a room and, and all of those guidelines. So they were going into that affluent community and having to mingle, you know, in a school where students are driving, you know, expensive cars to school. So mm -hmm. it's absolutely a challenge, but you're going to find the challenge anywhere they go. In general, how do they do academically? So part of what we're trying to do is bridge that achievement gap because it is not, um, it's not close. So just in, in my own state in California, um, you're looking at like a 54% graduation rate for foster youth compared to an 84%. You wow. know, just under there. So that's a huge, wow. um, you know, discrepancy. So um, we're very proud of our graduation rates and we're high above that um, and usually only have in the whole district about one that doesn't graduate a year, one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. And we want that to be yeah. zero. So there are absolutely things that you can do. There's new laws in place, especially in the state of California, that mm -hmm. is really helping that um, the, uh, achievement gap because it's helping, you know, when they transition and now they go to another school and they've missed out on those credits. Yeah. Uh, there's laws that are protecting for that and lower the graduation requirements and um, credits. So I feel so blessed um, that there, the movement is in the positive direction, um, that everyone is aware of what's going on with that achievement gap, and we're all like working hard to close that. Oh, that's so great. And before we go to break, Jen, I just wonder, how big a problem is this? Do we have any stats on how many foster youth there actually are in this country and in this state? So last year, um, or I think it was last year, and we're still trying to get our numbers um, from COVID, you know, that kind of changed a lot of things. Um, but we have over 391,000 in the United States. Now in California, where I live, um, it's about like 54,000 um, plus. And um, mm -hmm. in my county alone, I have, you know, around 6,000. Um, LA County in California is, is the biggest and probably one of the biggest in the United States uh, mm -hmm. for foster youth. So there is just too many, way too many. Yes, there are. All right. On that note, let's take a little break. And when we come back, let's talk about some of the programs that there are to help these kids. We'll be right back. Paula Shaw here. I'm thrilled that LifeWave Phototherapy Patches, which use no drugs or chemicals, have become a part of my life and my business. My family and I all use their wearable patch technology, and the results are life-changing. My parents in their 90s used the X39 patch, which activates stem cells, reverses aging, and improves the function of every area of the brain. I love X39 because I can work out with the 30-year-olds with no problem. And it's erased my fine lines and given my skin a youthful glow. LifeWave patches use a patented form of phototherapy, frequencies of light, to safely boost health and wellness at the cellular level. No drugs. To learn more, go to my website, lifewave.com forward slash safe health. That's lifewave.com forward slash safe health. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio. I'm your host, Paula Shaw. And with me today is Jenna Mendez, who is a professional. Or, but I want to get this straight this time because she's got <laughs> great credentials. And last time I didn't get it so, so well. Foster Youth Counselor. She's the liaison to the All Stars program, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. She is a licensed professional clinical counselor, nationally board certified counselor, certified counselor, and an adjunct professor at Chapman University. So, Jenna, let's talk a little bit about the programs to help these kids. We've we've really looked at why they're totally grievers, the upheaval, the change they've been through, and maybe that they go through time and time again. Because as you've described to us, it's not like they just get into a home and then that's where they stay until they're 18. Um, and I did some reading in the material you sent me about um, group homes and, and some people who have grown up 
or spent three years and more in a group home um, and what that experience is like. So you've mentioned several things as we've been discussing that your district is doing to try to ease this upheaval for these kids, try to give them more stability and try to give them a leg up, so to speak, so that they can compete academically and, and achieve what we would hope they can achieve. So there's a program now that you are the liaison to called All Stars. So tell us about All Stars. So All Stars started at the um, school that I was a high school, um, like a intervention counselor, like a crisis counselor there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was actually started by a counselor who was a former foster youth. So he would just pull in the students that have, um, that he knew you know, there was a large amount of foster youth and just it was more if he would buy them donuts and get them together so that they were getting that connection and that safety. Um, it grew. And so then we just started expanding it. Um, and then they created my position at the district. And so we expanded it um, TK through 12. So from preschool to 12th grade, we call our foster youth the all stars because it just gives, you know, a sense of belonging. They're in a club. Mm -hmm. um, yeah you know, a, an exclusive club and we're not referring to them as foster youth like they always get referred to. So mm -hmm. um, we do so many things now district wide. We hold um, events for them. Um, we at every site, every we have over 50 school um 50 schools in my district and every site has all stars and it's run by the site counselor. So they meet with their students mm -hmm. once a month. They help them with anything that they need. Um, and then I'm kind of like the behind the scenes gal and mm -hmm. um, planning all of the events that are district wide and just kind of doing the troubleshooting things um, for individual students. Um, we just recently took students we've gone to the zoo we've taken them like oh, we want to give them experiences um we're doing a senior event we've taken them to dinner at a restaurant um for the seniors we do mentoring so there's so many different elements that that we do just to make them feel connected to school and making them feel like they're not alone and that is the biggest goal. And along with that, we're hoping that we're then increasing attendance rates and behavior is going down and, um, you know, academics are going up. So it's kind of, you know, working hand in hand, um, making them feel connected and making sure that if they leave us, whenever they leave us to go somewhere else, that mm -hmm. they know that our district cared about them. There were individuals that cared about them mm -hmm. and then they got some things that they needed taken care of. That is so beautiful. So perfect. So how often does this group meet? So at every school site, they meet with them um, once a month. So it's up to them how that looks because every school is different and they have different, you know, amounts of students. So it's really the, um, the counselors get the flexibility, but we also do district wide events. So um, mm -hmm. my my current position is out of our parent engagement center, which has been just a game changer. Um, which I have an amazing director who works with our homeless population as well. So we kind of bridge the two programs. Oh. Those are Club Hope students and then we're the um, all stars. And so we just recently took families because um, she her idea is to include families. We want mm -hmm. them the opportunities to do things together, even mm -hmm. um, foster families. And so we took them all to this very large pizza restaurant that has games and activities. So we took over 120 um, of our, our people there and they had a great time with their families. And so we're looking for things like that to just give them experiences um, and life skills. And we also help them graduate and then also connect them with the community college when they leave so that it's kind of like a warm handoff um, for our seniors that we know that they're going to be connected and taken care of at the next you know, stage for them. Oh, that sounds amazing on so many levels. I just really love that. And, you know, it brings to mind, I interviewed on the show last year, um, a guy named Dylan Bender. He's a counselor with the VA. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, he had, had just written a book called The Warrior's Dilemma. And he we were discussing PTSD, which yeah. I don't know if that's too big of a, of a word to use with these kids, but it feels to me like they go through a lot of PTSD. 
And one of the things Dylan was saying is that they found in studies that if they can just take these, these, in his case, he was working with veterans with PTSD. If they can get them somewhere where they feel connected. Absolutely. The suicide rate went down to 4%. And mm -hmm. suicide is a huge problem with these veterans. So what I love about what you're describing with All Stars is you're giving them a place to connect. You're giving them a play, an identity, something that they belong to, a place where they feel cared about, resources. Right. I mean, that's huge. It's really wonderful. And I may have missed that if you said this, but is this program just... California, your district, or is it happening in the whole country? So it's our district has this particular program that we created, which is why I go at anyone, every, anywhere I can go for them to listen, to show them like, this is how you do it. I'm giving you the whole thing. Do it in your district. Call me if you need anything. Um, so I know a lot of, especially in my state, a lot of districts are now getting involved also because um, California has passed amazing laws. So it is starting to turn that way. But recently um, there was an article written um, in Youth Today and it was about our district and it was a national, this is a national online um, publication. And so some somebody, an advocate from New York heard it. She contacted me, came out, visited our site uh -huh. um, and connected with me. And then I invited her to come to, I, we just had in the state of California, um, a foster youth summit. Mm -hmm. So all the people in the state of California that work with foster youth can come to the summit. It was amazing. It's, you know, they've done it for about five years now. And she was saying they don't have anything like that in New York. So she came to bring things back so she could advocate. So I know that different states do different things. Um, but if they could replicate what California is doing, they really are on the cutting edge of moving in this positive direction for foster youth. And everybody needs to be on the you know same page. We all need to be working together. So no matter you know what state you go to in the United States, yeah. you know that you're going to be taken care of. Oh, absolutely. Especially because we're talking about children. Right. And we need to prioritize the children in, in this country for sure. But, yeah. you know, every state needs to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. How are these kinds of programs funded, Jenna? That's a great question. Um, so there is written into the districts. Um, it, it's called an L, um, LCAP plan, but it's it basically is like their budget for how they separate um, you know, how the money is allocated. And so foster and homeless youth actually have a, a place in um, our district and in the state. Everybody has to have a money allocated towards these two groups. Um, hopefully that's going to start with other states as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a big chunk of where the funding comes from. But I also get things from private donors, community members, like the local Rotary sponsors the senior dinner oh. for one of the schools and, um, and grants that we write um, for, you know, the state and get money allocated that way. So I kind of laugh you know, with everybody that I'm like a hoarder, I will take whatever they want to <laughs> donate, whatever they want to give, um, because somewhere along the line, somebody's going to need it. And I, I save all of those um, things. And, you know, with foster youth, they don't get a lot of choice. Um, so as many choices as they can get, um, we'd like to give them. So we'd like to give, you know, resources and, you know, incentives for grades mm -hmm. and for attending events and different things. But there's very strict guidelines to what some of that money can be um, used for. So if I didn't have private, you know, wonderful donors and community people that have reached out of uh, the kindness of their own hearts, um, I, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of these things. So definitely for a good, you know, advice for people is to look in your local community, see what's out there. And people want to give, they just don't know how. And they all assume, you know, that foster youth maybe need clothes or they need toiletries or blankets and you know our foster youth want uh our foster youth want um gift cards and things that they can feel self-actualized yes. with so you know, yes. and and boost their self-esteem so um definitely look in the community people are willing to give you've made me so happy because i am a proud member of the rotary 
a rotary group here in San Diego, because we have many of them. And I was going to, I know we, um, we have several different kinds of groups and nonprofits and stuff that we sponsor and that we help. And I was wondering if you take donations from groups like Rotary. Oh, so that's so mm -hmm. great to know. I that take it off. <laughs> up and that they can. So good. All right. We will encourage everybody to reach out in your local area and find out what your school districts, what your community, what your county is doing for foster youth yeah. and anything you want. So donations, would that include clothes, food, money? What yeah. So we have like a heart, um, what we call a heart closet. And um, we only ask for new things. Um, so because we want part of that is wanting them to feel good, yes. um, not like they're getting a handout, you know, yes. so so we have a heart closet. So if a student needs something, we have that for them. We've had bikes donated. So we use those for raffle prizes. Um, gift cards are always helpful because we mm -hmm. give those to the students or our seniors when they graduate, they get a full like gift bag. Um, so yeah, there's so many different ways um, that you could help. Beautiful. Wonderful. And on that note, we need to take a quick break and we'll be right back with Jenna Mendez and our discussion about how can we help the children. Be right back. For those looking to improve their lives, there's nobody better to turn to than Paula Shaw. Paula helps people regain successful lives by identifying and eliminating self-sabotaging behavior using a multitude of mind-body techniques to identify and resolve their core issues. Working with a wide variety of healing modalities, she provides her clients with the most effective process for their specific needs. To book a session with Paula, call 858-480-9234. That's 858-480-9234. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio. I'm here with Jenna Mendez, who is an expert and an incredibly experienced in working with foster youth. And although she is credentialed and board certified as a school counselor, she has this specialty knowledge that I'm feeling we're so blessed with today because I'll tell you, Jenna, I have learned a ton. And I realize, and I'm a former teacher, but I don't remember any programs that were specific to foster youth or to children that came from troubled homes, you know, that sort of thing. I know we had programs that for those that needed help with special ed, but mm -hmm. I don't remember anything like what you're talking about today. And it just warms my heart to know that the people at the district level, at the county level, at all these different levels are thinking about the children and, and the things right. you described that you're doing, that All Stars is doing for these kids. It's just wonderful. wonderful. Well, we've got to talk about it so that things can change. Exactly. And that's exactly why you're here today. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had no idea that there was so much and, and that it's so well thought out. Even like in the last segment, you were saying, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, I, did you call it the heart closet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that you want new things. So these children don't feel like second class mm -hmm. citizens so that they feel that they've got a shot, you know, right. they've got a new jacket too, right? Or they're wearing the cool tennis shoes that right. everyone is wearing. Because one of the things you and I talked about a little bit ago is it's got to be tough for these kids going into a school where there are affluent families right. attending. And now, you know, they've got to compete. Right. There's always all that um, peer peer group competition, you know, and they've got to be able to see that, the you know, somebody's wearing the really cool tennies that are the in thing to have now. And I'm not sure that those kinds of things are provided for these kids. Right. So I feel like the challenges are huge on so many levels for them. Well, and at the beginning of the school year, we have a huge um, back to school event. So we've gotten, you know, a lot of school supplies donated. 
Um, and so it's out of our parent engagement center. So we invite all of our Club Hope and All Stars um, families. And we also have like resource tables out. We have a dental place that comes in. Oh. So when they come, they're getting snacks. They're feeling welcome. They're getting a full outfit for school. They're mm -hmm. getting a new backpack with new supplies. Um, they get, you know, all kinds of goodies. I mean, they leave with a lot of stuff. And I know a lot of districts do that. And I, I, it makes me so happy because they leave ready to learn. And mm. we cannot expect them to come in and, you know, perform academically when they're worried about where they're going to sleep, what they're going to eat, where their family yes. is. I mean, there's no way that you could mm -hmm. learn and be focused when you're work concerned about all of these things. Mm -hmm. So how do you identify the kids that really need to be seeing you or seeing the school counselor? So um, I kind of get that higher level. I have a lot of administrators that will reach out to me. And so I'm kind of consulting okay. with them. Um, but I also know when every new student enrolls. So I make sure I work with the school site registrar to make sure that everything in our system is correct, that mm -hmm. we have all the information we need. Their social workers, they are all assigned an attorney. And California made it okay. a new state law that you cannot... Um, do behavioral issues or or move forward with certain things until you contact that attorney. So now part of it is getting that information. Mm -hmm. um, and so just making sure that when they come to us, they are ready, that the school counselor knows who they are, that the administrator knows who they are so that they can all feel very welcome at their school site. Because we have over in our district, you know, right now we have over 250, but over the course of a year, it's easily 400 you know, students that transition and I cannot physically meet with every single one of them. So I'm so blessed to have wonderful, you know, administrators and school staff and counselors that do that. Oh, that's so great. What about their medical needs? How is that handled? So usually that is kind of on the social services side. Mm -hmm. um, they make sure that, um, well, Foster youth are allowed immediate enrollment without immunizations. So that's a, a law that California has so that they can start school even if they don't have all of the required documentation and immunization. So mm -hmm. they'll have to go and get those things, but they can at least start because a lot of times things get lost um, and pa paperwork is gone. So mm -hmm. um, most of the medical needs are handled on the side of um you know, social services, but we have nurses that kind of check with everything. If they need medication at school, we make sure that we have the forms completed and everything to help them with that. So the theme of this show today was how do we help? And in, in our last segment, we talked a little bit about donations, that kind of thing. What if you're just a a person like myself who has a heart for these kids, is there any way you could be like a big brother or a big sister or somehow help in their lives without being part of your district staff? Yes. So um, we actually have a program in California called Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and we pair. <laughs> it's a mentoring oh, program. Who so knew? We pair with that. But there's also, um, I know, you know, in the United States, a lot of different states have their own um, advocates for foster youth. Here, we call them CASAs in California, um, court appointed special advocates. Uh, but these are adults that are not paid, voluntary, like yourself, mm -hmm. that commits to a child. And mm -hmm. they are there supporting them academically, emotionally, every, you know, in every way they are their advocate and support so that they have someone. Um, but they are not paid and they are doing this out of the kindness of, of their own heart. Mm -hmm. But there's also local foster um, family agencies in your community that you can look up that. I know we have a huge one out here that is always looking for donations or has, you know, special events that they hold in fundraisers. Um, if you have items that are brand new that you think that they could use, contact one of those agencies and see if you can drop off some things. Or the holidays are, you know, yeah. especially hard for students. So um, contacting them to make, I know that same organization was having people help out making Easter baskets for all of mm. their um, children 
you mm -hmm. know, that they have, but at Christmas, Christmas gifts, you know, even the little holidays, Valentine's birthdays are huge. So in our all stars program, I send out an email to every um, foster youth, you know, either to their um, guardian or to them, if they're old enough, a little happy birthday card, um, mm -hmm. at certain sites do birthday celebrations. So there's lots of things that you can do if you just even look in your local area. You know, you bring up the holidays and oof, talk about a pain in my heart. I I was thinking when I was reading about the group homes, that's got to be a tough time and a tough place to be during the holidays. Absolutely. But I would imagine even if you're in a foster home, and I'm sure, like you said, there are some people who are just loving, great people that want to open their home and their arms to these kids. Right. But as the child it's still not your family. Totally. It's still not your familiar place. And in a group home, what do they do there for the holidays? Do they just try to have, you know, like group functions, like a special breakfast or that kind of thing? Or do these kids, this is probably a silly question, but is there ever a situation where they get to go visit their real parents, like maybe during the holidays or something? Yeah, so they try. If they are court ordered and allowed, mm -hmm. um, they will try to to allow that child to be with their family if it's appropriate. Okay. So definitely they can do that. But I've had some, um, especially the high schoolers, that will say their foster family was going on vacation. So there are special mm -hmm. emergency housing, so which is so traumatizing in itself. Because let me oh. ship you off to somewhere else so we can go have a family vacation. Yeah. So um, and that very much angers me, but um, mm. it is really challenging for them at the holidays and you're just feeling awkward and not accepted and you're not with your own, you know, right. Family. So it is extremely, extremely difficult. Mm. Yeah. I, I just, <laughs> that could just about bring me to tears because the holidays are such an important time in our family and, and I just thinking of anybody yeah. who doesn't have family during the holidays is painful, really painful. Um, one of the other things that comes up for me in thinking about these kids is, is just we need, as humans, we need to be hugged. We need to be touched. We need to, to feel loved. Where do these kids get that kind of need met? Because maybe even great foster parents... I don't know. Are they, do they take these kids in and treat them like their own or, you know, and especially in a group home, I would think this could be a problem. So what, what do we do? What can we do? How can we help Jen? I think it's important to remember that you don't know where that foster youth is at or what experiences they've had. So although we may want to love on them and give them lots of hugs, mm -hmm. that may be a trigger for them. That's a good so, point it's very important to kind of gauge and to be very patient because when you're working with a foster youth, there's layers and layers, you know, of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I usually allow them to share as much as they would like, as little as they would like, and I meet them where they're at and really be patient because mm -hmm. um, you can go in too quick and you think that you are doing this wonderful thing and, and they're done. <laughs> you just now ruin the relationship and you'll never be able to get that back. So yeah. I always um, kind of just treat everyone like they've experienced trauma because most of us have and just <laughs> proceed with caution and let them control the situation and how much or little, you know, what is going on. Um, so, you know, if uh, it just takes one trusted adult. And I know it's very cliche, but it really just takes one trusted adult. And if you can be that for a foster youth, you know, in whatever capacity that means, it it could be an amazing thing for them. Oh, that was so beautiful. <laughs> that was really, really beautifully said, Jenna. And I think this is be a perfect place to ask you to read something that you sent me ahead of time, written by a guy named Robert Kaplinsky, who spent many years of his life in a group home, who grew, I, I, you could say in a way, he grew up in a group home, not the entire life, I assume, but certainly his high school years. And 
in, in putting this show together and thinking about what I hoped we would share with people today, one of the big points that I hoped we could get across and that I think you've done beautifully with Jenna is how do we help? How can we help the children? We're all heartbroken when we think about children who grow up in a situation where they don't have loving, caring parents. Right. And they don't have a home that's consistent and that they can count on. You've given us a lot of information today about what's being done to try to make up for that huge deficit. So if you would, Jenna, if you want to um, close with what Robert Kaplinsky said about what, are the, what do they need? What do they really need? And I think it's, a, before I read that, it's important to just remember that we cannot fix everybody. We cannot fix their trauma. We cannot fix everything that's happened to them. But the more positive adults they have, the more positive experiences mm -hmm. they have, that's going to heal them. So though anything you can give, we're all at different places, but anything you can give um, is you know, is, is perfect. So um, this was his take on um, experiencing a group home and what he would like people to know. And this goes along with group home or foster home. But sometimes when we don't know what to do or say, we don't do anything at all. For students who live in foster care or at group homes, this is not the way to go. They desperately need our help, but don't know how to ask for it. They are looking for someone to love them and make them feel welcome. If at all possible, be that person for them. Be a fan who cheers for their successes. Be a mentor who will listen and give advice. Be someone who believes in them, even when they don't believe in themselves. They may never tell you thanks, but it will mean a great deal to them. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. It gives me chills. And Jenna, for our listeners, could you give them the way they can reach out to you if they want more information or certainly want that template for all yeah. stars and what your district is doing. Yes, I am so willing to help anybody um, to, you know, wherever, whatever your journey is. Um, but my um, private email is Jenna, J-E-N-N-A-M for Mendez counseling at gmail.com. So feel free to reach out. I, I love this population. I'm passionate about what I do um, and I'm willing to help in whatever way I can. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you is all I can say. Thank you for who you are, for what you do and for what you shared with us today, Jenna. It was truly my honor to have you here. Thank you. And remember that um, I wear blue because blue is for um, foster care awareness month. That is in May. So take extra, you know, send extra light and love um, to those foster, you know, children in foster care in May, especially and wear blue to support. Yes. And let's all make a pledge to ourselves right here today to find some way to help foster youth in May. And you've got a couple of weeks now to figure out how to do it. So let's do it. <laughs> and email me if you have suggestions or need help. <laughs> yes, there you go. All right. Bless you, Jenna. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you to all our listeners and viewers. And we will see you next week on Change It Up Radio. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for joining me on Change It Up Radio. I hope you found this episode informative and entertaining. If you want to hear past shows or you want to get information on being a guest or a sponsor of this show, go to changeitupradio.com. We all know that change is inevitable and it's necessary, but darn it, it's also tricky. My goal is to help you make the experience of change smoother and more productive. If you've benefited from this show, please subscribe to it, share it, and review it. That helps me to tune into what you really want to hear and what you really want to learn more about. Remember, you can find us on every major podcast platform and also on YouTube, Facebook, Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. We look forward to seeing you next week for Change It Up Radio.